Hello and welcome to another episode of the Gritty Hour. I have a very special guest tonight. I have Brandon Williams, who's a common law lawyer and the founder of the Amnesty Coalition. Welcome to the Gritty Hour, Brandon. Thank you very much, huh? It's a pleasure to have you here. So you. tell us a little bit about the Amnesty Coalition. So the Amnesty Coalition is essentially a, a group of people that have come together temporarily in order to forgive and educate all of the people who are uh, behind the scenes secretly creating the entire incorporated prison structure that we are, we find ourselves in here in America. And as I'm learning, especially very recently in many other countries as well, and uh, it's a prison involving the definitions of words. So what we do is we dig through the definitions of words, we find and piece together the correct definitions of words, and then we promote those definitions in a fun, engaging, and easy to understand way. Okay, that sounds uh, that sounds good. And and do you do you represent clients in that sense? No, no. The Amnesty Coalition is something completely separate from a lot of the other things that I'm doing. It's sort of like the official club, I guess you could say, of what I do. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I do is I'm I'm like sort of like the head researcher, I guess you could say, in this movement. OK. And uh, what I do is I dig through the laws and I dig through the the, the dictionaries and I piece together uh, what the law actually means. And um very few people have ever attempted such a seemingly impossible feat, but I have a lot of help from a lot of people and uh, we do a pretty damn good job of it. And it is terribly, terribly exciting. Good. Um, we're getting, you know, we're, we're living tax free lives legally, uh, no federal income tax, no sales tax, no payroll tax, no state tax, no city tax, whatever other taxes you want to bring up. We are uh, legally exempt. I have a lifetime exemption for sales tax on Amazon. Uh, we have full diplomatic immunity. Uh, we're able to drive around in, in our cars and stuff like that without having to worry about being accosted by police. Uh, we cannot be arrested for any uh, crimes that do not have a victim that actually presses charges. And that's just tip of the iceberg. There's a, a tremendous amount of uh, things that we are digging up through our research. It's pretty mind boggling stuff, actually. It's kind of why this is getting so big. It's just so wild. And what's funny is it just keeps getting wilder. I mean, if you would have talked to me six months ago, we were talking about some of the wildest shit available. Now we're probably, you know, four, five, six times beyond where we were six months ago. So it just gets crazier and crazier and crazier as we progress. And um, we just keep piecing it together as we go. And uh, we, we find it to be we're having a blast. So, yeah, well, I think a lot of people are now discovering that yesterday's conspiracy is today's truth. So, yeah. uh, but tell us a little bit about the, um, I was looking at your site earlier, uh, being a U.S. citizen versus a United States of America system, a uh, citizen and, and how that affects, you know, your rights and whatever. Yeah. So, so after the civil war, uh, they, there was two sides of the coin. Everybody knows that, right? There's the people who wanted to keep slavery and there's people who didn't want to keep slavery. So what they did was at the very, very end of the Civil War, there was two really, really big things that happened during that time. These are like the two most monstrous things that changed the course of our entire country uh, all the way up to present time. Right. The first change that occurred right around the end of the Civil War was they changed the definition of the word person to include legal fictions such as corporations associations um uh etc right so so when you see for example uh one of the things that most people have have seen to some degree is they've seen like the state of california versus tom you know whatever mm -hmm. so in law state of california is considered a person legally that definitionary change occurred right at the very end of the Civil War, right around the same time that the original government was basically eliminated and a completely incorporated government took its place. And that happened in, I think, 1871, uh, the Organic Act of 1871. And I believe the definition of the word person was changed just a few years before that. 
So what happened was is that the the government itself became a person. And basically that person creates other persons. And it sounds completely insane, but basically that is the the core aspect of the insanity of what we experience now because what's happening is is that there's actually every single person in America is actually two different persons. They don't use the word people because the thing is, is that people is part of the original government and the constitution. They use the word persons to indicate corporations or associations. And what they do is they create corporations of our names in all capital letters when we're born. And those all capital letter names are persons. And then they simply ask us if we are identifying ourselves as that person, when we say yes, we are by definition saying that we are a corporation and in their eyes, we are waiving our human rights by identifying ourselves as a corporation rather than a natural person or human being. Hmm. And this is the, this is the entire bird's eye view of the scam of which we are living inside of. And and as we've gotten deeper and deeper and deeper into researching this, even a lot of the people in the government don't know anything about this. So, so, so we've, we've gone this entirely different route where we've decided to create an amnesty coalition about the subject, which is basically where we automatically assume that everyone we're going to talk to does not actually know what's going on, even in the government, even in the highest levels of government. Even in Congress, we assume that the people in Congress do not know what's going on. So we, as the Amnesty Coalition, uh, are, are taking an assumptive position of basically it's our job to now educate everybody, including Congress, including the House of Representatives, including everybody. Okay. And so what we're doing is we're digging up all this information and what it means, and then we're compiling it in a way that makes it more simple and interesting and then we're we're sharing it with the world and that's basically what what we're doing and what we stand for and uh i can actually prove a lot of this information very very rapidly there's a lot of people talking about this they can't they can't point you toward the correct spots so if you go to 28 usc 3002 in google usc stands for united states code so you just type in 28 space usc space 3002 you're going to go to cornell law school uh, pull it right up there. You'll see it'll say definitions. You're going to scroll down to subsection 15. Let me just, uh, if you if you have a second, I just want to share this uh, screen. So I do have that in front of me now. Yeah, yeah, sure. And then I'll let you walk me through it. Yeah, that'd be great. I don't know if you can see it on your screen. The, the Yeah, now it's going to be uh, 28 USC 3002. Oh, sorry. It's okay. All right, so 28... Most people have never looked up a single statute before, so this is exciting. <laughs> 28 space USC... Space 3002. And now you're going to go to Cornell, and then you're going to scroll down to subsection 15. You can read the, the heading for subsection 15, and then just subsection A. Uh, subsection I... B and C are a little bit complicated. So just, just 15 and 15A, just read those. Oh no! You don't click on oh, it. I don't. I, I see. Okay. So United States thing. means a federal corporation. There you go. Okay. And then the, the other two are much more complicated sub definitions, but basically okay. we'll just keep it simple, right? Now, if you open up another tab in your uh, web browser, mm -hmm. and you're going to go to uh, you're going to go to UCC. Uh, go ahead and open up another tab on your web browser. Yeah, hold on. It's hard to do that with the uh, the beautiful Zoom share screen. Oh, option. it's in your way. Yeah, hold on one second. Okay, so we're going to hit another tab. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm putting in what? UCC space 9-307. All right, let me just uh, share that screen while you're here. Did you need to have both of them up at the same time? No, it's okay. One, okay. one at a time is okay. 
And so, uh, UCC um, stands for Uniform Commercial Code, by the way. And then okay. uh, you're going to click on that one there, Cornell University. Uh, the location gonna... of debtor. Yeah, click on All that. Right. And then you're going to go down to subsection H. And you're going to read subsection H. Location of the United States. The United States is located in the District of Columbia. Mm -hmm. Okay. So United States is a corporation. Mm -hmm. That corporation is located in the District of Columbia. It's not located in North America. It's not this gigantic thing that encompasses all of the 50 states. Mm -hmm. It's only inside of the District of Columbia. Okay. And what we can do is um, if you uh, go ahead and open up another shared screen, another okay. shared tab. I know it's kind of a pain. No, it's all right. I'm I'm enthralled, so we're good. Okay. <laughs> Hit it. Uh, 26 USC 7701. 7701. Uh, 7701. Okay. Title 26, uh, whenever you hear the term 26 at the beginning of any of these, 26 mm -hmm. USC, 26 is the Internal Revenue Code. It's the tax code through okay. the IRS. Okay. So 26 mm -hmm. USC 7701, and then you're going to go to Cornell, and then you're going to go to subsection one. That's the definition of person. And then we're also going to clear up another definition as well. Okay. The term person shall be construed to mean and include any or an individual, a trust, a state, partnership, association, company, or corporation. So this is the big trick. So when they write you a, a tax bill and it's got your name in all capital letters, you have to ask them, are they referring to the natural person or are they, re are they referring to a corporation? Because they, the answer is they're always, always, always referring to a corporation. When you look in, uh, when you look in Black's Law. And, and, and when the, you ask them that, do they know what the hell you're talking about? No, most of the time they absolutely do not, right? Yeah. Uh, there are some of them that do. It's not super common, right? Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is that when you look up the definition of the word corporation in Black's Law, which I can just either read or I can do a screen share. Yeah, uh, actually, it would have been easier if I just uh, uh, let you do the screen sharing. Yeah, if you want to turn on my screen sharing, and then uh, I'll I'll go back in there in just one second, and okay. uh, I will uh, I will share my screen. I'm just going to find this 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 definition of corporation. There it is. Let me just uh, give you the permission. Corporation to do the screen sharing. One second, sorry. Mm, it's okay. Corporate name. Let's see here. <sighs> Well, while I'm doing that, let me ask you a question uh, back to you used the state of California as an example before. Um, number one, are we talking about federal law? When well, they, federal, when they... if you if you look at the definition of United States, you'll notice that the word federal, when it says a federal corporation back there, mm -hmm. when we were looking at that first one, 28 USC 3002. Mm hmm. Uh, that, that capital F, what that signifies, and I haven't been able to find anything in black and white. This is just through lots and lots of digging and just seeing it over and over again. Whenever they use a capital F for federal or a capital S for state, they're referring for they're referring only to the corporate side of it. So so when they say federal and it's a capital F, what that means is they're saying corporate state to corporate state. But the problem is, is that all of the corporations are all located in the District of Columbia. So federal is just a scam word. It doesn't really exist. Hmm. There is no federal because it's all all 50, quote, corporate states, as well as the, quote, United States are hmm. all located in the District of Columbia. There is no federal. So even when, because you had mentioned uh, this definition really came to be right after the end of the Civil War. And that lets me, uh, you know, makes me curious as states became part of the United States, you know, yeah, as so, territories so at became that time, part, yeah, at that time, they incorporated all of the states. It's just that the confusing part, people think that state of California, the corporation is located in the landmass called California. That's mm -hmm. the, that's the deadly assumption. It's an assumption, right? 
The thing is, is that state of California, the corporation, is not located in the landmass known as California. Right. They're two completely different locations. And that's what's so confusing. So when you sign up for um, uh, voter registration, you're signing a document that states that you reside or domicile in state of California. Mm -hmm. That means that you're saying that you reside or domicile in the District of Columbia. This is how they get jurisdiction over you. So okay. each state had to acquiesce to that as, or each territory had to acquiesce to that before they became, before they achieved statehood. No, it's actually not like that at all. What it is, is that um, it has nothing to do. There, there actually isn't any state government. So, mm -hmm. The California government, quote unquote, is just a corporation that operates within the territorial limits of people who say and under penalty of perjury that they live in the corporation called state of California because mm -hmm. everyone in the landmass called California signs all the documentation stating that they live in a corporation called state of California. The whole thing is operated in a way where it's it's just it's it's completely just an illusion. For example, I'm not filed as though I live in state of California. I tell them straight up that I don't live in the corporation called state of California. So I live in California, but but the people who supposedly run California it has nothing to do with what I am and the status that I am. It's two completely separate worlds. Mm -hmm. Everyone in California who signed documentation stating that they live in the corporation called State of California, they automatically work through. It's an assumption based system. Mm -hmm. Does that include uh, you have the ability to share? So I should have told you that. Sorry. Oh, yeah. 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 Let me share um, this. So I'm going to share with you the uh, where is it? I'm going to share with you the definition of corporation that I'm referring to specifically. OK. Does that include uh, the draft or in this case, the selective service? Yeah, and we're going to get into that as well. Okay. Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, let me see here. How do I? Oh, share screen. There it is. Okay. So we're going to share screen. And uh, can you see my screen now? Uh, no, I don't see what you share. Maybe it's just loading. It's possible. I see it now. Yes. All right. So this is Black's Law, and then here's the word corporation right here. Okay. Now, uh, the part that's really fascinating, it's a long, goes on for pages and pages, but we're going to find uh, one part of this that is really, really interesting that I think you guys will like. This is what blew my mind, right? Let me just scroll down here. All right, here we go. Uh, so it says here, uh, private corporations are those founded by and composed of private individuals for private purposes, as distinguished from governmental purposes and having no political or governmental franchises and duties, right? But there's a different kind of... Um, well, can I, can I just see that again before I... Yeah, let me just, I'm going to, I'm going to skip that, 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 this part of the definition is included in this next part though, so check this I out. I see, okay. The true distinction between public and private corporations is that the former are organized for governmental purposes, the latter not. The term public has sometimes been applied to corporations of which the government owned the entire stock, as in the case of a state bank. Uh, but bear in mind, but bearing in mind that public is here equivalent to political. Okay. So they're referring to there's two types of corporations. There's a public corporation and there's a private corporation. And there's one other area where they get into this. It's really, really interesting. Uh, let me just see if I can find it. Let's see. Here. A lot of definitions. A lot of definitions. Let's see here. There's one that I really like that I hope I can find here pretty rapidly. Basically, a, a public corporation is a corporation that is used as an agency for civil government. Mm-hmm. 
and I'm oh here we go here we go here we go public and private a public corporation is one created by the state for political purposes and to act as an agency in the administration of civil government generally within a particular territory or subdivision of the state and usually invested for that purpose with i'm just going to skip some of this stuff it's kind of complicated okay these are sometimes called political corporations so what it is is that your your name in all capital letters is actually a public political corporation and it's mm. created by the state for political purpose and it's supposed to act as an agency in the administration of civil government so what that means is it's basically like uh like like the intermediary so the reason why all your paperwork and all your taxes and all your bills are all in the all capital letter name is because they can't really talk to you directly. They can only talk to you via the political corporation because the political corporation acts as an agency in the administration of civil government. OK, mm -hmm. so so what happens is, is that we take that back to the definition that we had found in uh, 26 U.S.C. 7701 subsection one. And you see here that there's you're actually two persons in law, right? You are you are an individual, and then you also have a company which which acts as a public company, which is a political company which acts as an agency in 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 civil government. Okay, and this is actually how the system actually works, right? Now the way it works is that to show you another aspect here, um, if we go to 42 USC 9102. This is subsection 18. This is the definition of a United States citizen, right? It means any individual who is a citizen of the United States by law, birth, or naturalization, okay? Now, naturalization is a really interesting thing, um, but but just to keep it simple. So, so naturalization, people think naturalization means something really complicated like getting a green card or doing something crazy. Uh, 18 USC. We're, we're gonna we're gonna piece all this together here. So bear with okay. me just a moment. That's all right. I'm I'm still with you, believe it or not. <laughs> okay, good. So if you go to uh, 8 USC 8 USC 1101 subsection um, uh, A23, the term naturalization means the conferring of nationality of a state upon a person after birth by any means whatsoever. So. The people think that that to, to come into the country, you have to do a green card. People think to come into the country, you have to get your citizenship. You don't have to do any of that shit. All you have to do is create an affidavit where you're conferring nationality of a state upon yourself and sends it in. That's all you have to do. I'm not kidding. You can probably even get a passport being a, quote, illegal alien if you follow the steps of naturalization as it's defined in 8 USC 1101 subsection A23. Okay. So you're confirming your nationality to a state, meaning any of the 50 states? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, by definition, a state is any is any group or nation. It's not even a it's not even a land based definition. So the definition of the word state basically just means like a like a like a political group of some sort. It doesn't even mean a location necessarily. That's the part where it gets even more confusing, right? Yeah. So, for example, I I have conferred the nationality of California state, not the state of California, on myself, and I have also conferred the nationality of the Amnesty Coalition on myself. The Amnesty Coalition is, by definition, a nation. When you start researching very heavily what the definition of the word nation means, it means a group of people uh, operating as a political whole. It's basically the same definition as society. Nation and society mean basically the same thing, essentially, right? Mm -hmm. Has nothing to do with location, has nothing to do with land. It has to do with a, a certain mentality that's shared by a group. That's the definition of the word nation. So I have my own nation called the the, the Amnesty Coalition, and I have conferred um uh that state on myself by any means whatsoever through affidavit. Okay. So you can be, uh, you can create the the nation of the the gritty hour podcast, and you just literally just write it up on a sheet of paper. I have a a whole section on my website that breaks down and defines what the nation of the Amnesty Coalition is all about, what we stand for, etc. And then there's even a document that people can use and uh, to go and get a special diplomatic passport if they want to uh, by by using 
my documentation. Okay, but going back to United States citizen. So definition A, any individual who is a citizen of the United States by law, birth, or naturalization. Okay, so the thing is, is that um, you, you have two different sides of this whole thing. You have yourself, and then you have the, the political corporation, the public corporation, which is your name in all capital letters. Okay, so the, the political corporation is a U.S. citizen and always will be a U.S. citizen forever. Because it's 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 a corporation that's located in the District of Columbia. Your name in all capital letters is a corporation that's located in the District of Columbia. It's a subcorporation of the state in which you were born. Okay, mm -hmm. so you are not that same name, that same public corporation, and you are not a U.S. citizen. Only the corporation is. Okay, so so definition A. You have here like, oh, well, I am a U.S. citizen. The thing is, is that you're actually not. If you go into expatriation definition in the USC, because I forget where this is at. 26 USC uh, 877AG2, expatriate. The term expatriate means any United States citizen who relinquishes his citizenship. So what you're doing is, is you're expatriating. Mm -hmm. When you expatriate, then you're no longer a U.S. citizen. But what's crazy is look at definition B and C of United States citizen. Uh, should I read it? Yeah, go ahead and read it. I mean, out loud, any federal, state, or local government in the United States or any entity of any such government. Any federal, state, or local government in the United States or any, okay. Any corporation, partnership, association, or other entity organized or existing under the laws of the United States or any state. So that's, okay, which has its president or the executive officer and its chairman of the board of directors or holder of similar office, an individual who is a United States citizen and which has no more of, it, of its directors who are not United States citizens than constitute a minority of the number required for a quorum. Okay. So and basically, to keep it simple, it's a corporation that it's mostly run by United States citizens. So if okay. if a corporation has mostly United States citizens that run it or have the board of directors and they're mostly United States citizens, the actual business itself is considered a United States citizen in law, which is pretty weird and creepy. Right. So what that means is that United States citizen could be a lot of different things. It's not just a human being. Right. You have to be very, very careful about this, this term. Right. So the thing is, is that once you go through an expatriation process, which is basically just by simply cleaning this up and saying that I'm not a United States citizen and I'm not living in the District of Columbia and I don't live in state of California or state of New York and I'm not a part of this whole corporate system. What happens is that you're going through an, a naturalization process. You're conferring nationality of a state upon yourself state of Calif uh, california state could be a nationality uh the gritty hour uh nation could be a nationality uh uh, uh you, you name it whatever first, whatever it is literally first, it's so it's so broad but first you're expa expatriating yourself is that the right term well once you once you go through naturalization mm -hmm. naturalization and expatriation occur at the same time okay so by going through the process of naturalization, you're de facto expatriating, expatriating. Okay. Yeah. okay. Now, once you expatriate, this is the term that's used to describe you. This is uh, 8 USC 1101 subsection A21. You can go ahead and read that one out loud. The term national means a person owing permanent allegiance to a state. Okay. So in my, in my, in my world, I have dual nationality. My, my one nationality is California state, okay? My other nationality is uh, the nation of the Amnesty Coalition. So I, I actually see. have dual nationalization. And is now it in terms of the government, the, yeah. yes, yes, okay. it is recognized by the government. And I will show you proof on that. The proof on that is 18 USC subsection 11, uh, foreign government defined. Uh, I'm going to read this because I'm going to skip over some of these middle parts. Okay. The term foreign government includes any government, faction, or body of insurgents within a country 
with which the United States is at peace. And this is the answer to your question, this last part, irrespective of recognition by the United States. Okay. So once United- you go through once you go through a naturalization process and you mm-hmm. confer uh, nationality of a state upon yourself, now you are legally defined as a foreign government. Oh, yeah, another I area see. I can def- I can show you another piece of proof on that is 18 USC 112. Uh, this is protection of foreign officials, official guests, and inter- internationally protected persons. So these are the various terms that they use to describe someone who has gone through this process and become a national through the process of nationalization. And then they also go through an expatriation process as part of that. Right? Does this, does this include it's very, diplomatic, very simple. Diplomatic immunity. Yes. Yeah, so this is how okay. we get this is how we get diplomatic immunity. I see. So okay. going through this process and getting diplomatic immunity are the same thing. So you're getting so so through naturalization. You're also expatriating and you're also gaining diplomatic immunity all at the same time. It's a package deal. Okay. So what happens is that they they have a whole section here which protects us. Now they they have these different terms that they use to describe people who are nationals, right? And here's all the different terms. They use foreign government, foreign official, internationally protected person, international organization, national of the United States, and official guest. Those are the six terms that we can use. Okay. So, so I can also use the term Californian when I'm representing myself as a national of California state. But when I'm representing myself as a national of the nation of the Amnesty Coalition, I wouldn't use anything besides these six terms. These are the mm-hmm. six terms that I would use that the government has officially recognized. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, foreign government is interesting because the bottom line is, is that as long as you're at peace, you do not need official recognition by the government. I see. Now you ask yourself, what does the definition of at peace mean? I've done a lot of research on that. That's an area that I've done a lot, a lot of research in. Uh, a lot of legal definitions, a lot of different things. Uh, to be honest with you, the definition that I like the most is the one that I actually used for the Amnesty Coalition under the definition of nation, right? Right. So I found this after doing a lot of digging, and I really, really liked it. So I'm going to read this. An independent body politic, a society of men united together for the purpose of promoting their their mutual safety and advantage by the joint efforts of their combined strength. But every combination of men who govern themselves independently of all others will not be considered a nation. A body of pirates, for example, who govern themselves are not a nation. To constitute a nation, another ingredient is required. The body thus formed must respect other nations in general and each of their members in particular. Such a society has her affairs and her interests. She deliberates and takes resolutions in common, thus becoming a moral person who possesses an understanding and will peculiar to herself and is susceptible of obligations and rights. This is the best definition I have ever found. What strikes me about this paragraph is the use of uh, men and she. Yes. Uh, so, So when you start getting into the much older uh, legal stuff, mm-hmm. uh, you start seeing the word men and women and and people uh-huh. as as the as the 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 corporate octopus has taken over our systems more and more and more and more and more. You're seeing those terms being used less and less and less and less in law because they're attempting to turn us all into unknowing corporations, essentially. But this paragraph it makes me think. Uh, an independent body politic is a group of men and the society is referred to as her and she, which is kind of Yes, at the end, yes. Well, because remember, the word person was redefined like in like probably 1867, probably mm-hmm. right around there. Mm-hmm. So we've had this this definition of person which means a corporation or a body politic or a society or a nation or if if the society or nation is incorporated. 
So it's one of those things where it's very confusing and it's, it's kind of, it's done this way on purpose. It's very confusing on purpose. It confuses uh, My people. assumption is it's on purpose. I just don't understand the purpose. You know the purpose I mean? is, is that if, if, if you de- redefine the word person mm-hmm. to include in corporations and mm-hmm. then you get people to read a document and it says person, 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 person over and over again, then it has their name in all capital letters and they can sign it. They assume that they're talking about a, a person, meaning a human being. Okay. You know how, uh, when this was written, what year? This one here. Um, no, I just no. found this like no, three days it. ago. Okay. So let me just see here. No, I'm just curious. It's, it's not, you know, I don't, I don't really know what all of this string of all this stuff means, um, mm-hmm. but it's probably located somewhere in this string of, of stuff. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Here we go. Let's see. Yeah, see, definition of nation right here yeah. in this dictionary. Uh, I don't, I don't know. I would need to dig more to find out when this was actually when this yeah, court case and, and, actually and took why place. Why it changes the gender throughout the paragraph just strikes me. And and like you said, it was done on purpose, but I just don't understand the purpose. Well, well, no, no. Uh, he doesn't actually change the gender. It's it's a society of men, mm-hmm. and then he refers to the society itself as a collective, as a she. Right. Okay. So he's not changing the gender. He's just he's saying a society of men, but the society itself being 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 genderized as a body politic. He's saying as she near the right. end of that. Do reference. you know why though? I would imagine it's no different than why they would they, would, they call vessels like uh, a ship. She's. A ship Probably would similar. be she. Okay, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. All yeah. right. I'm satisfied with that. <laughs> so a nation. A nation is a, a society of men that that becomes moral and respectable in relation to other nations. Mm-hmm. And that is a, a a wild definition that no one's ever found and no one's ever thought of. Most people think a nation is a landmass. Mm-hmm. It has absolutely nothing to do with a landmass or any physical location or boundaries of location. It has right. nothing to do with that. That's not the definition of nation. And you think it's actually not-, not the definition of state. The definition but, of state in, it, yeah. in its largest sense, this is from Black's Law, sixth edition right here, uh, a state is a body politic or a society of men. So state and nation basically mean the same thing. Mm-hmm. But do, do, do you think that and that's why you have. Do you think it adequately def, uh, uh, fulfills the obligation of defining itself as at peace with the other? And I think that's exactly why uh, in the in the USC, you have 18 USC 11 foreign mm-hmm. government defined includes any government faction or body of insurgents within a country with which the United States is at peace, irrespective of recognition by the United States. Right. And you feel like that that fulfills that obligation of considering exactly. it to be. And I feel peace. like this is the missing element. Mm-hmm. I feel like this is the big missing element for a lot of people that are in this arena who are learning this stuff and teaching this stuff. Mm-hmm. Without being at peace, you 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 aren't a foreign government. You don't have any recognition. You don't it's it's not really like getting recognition. It's just you you either you're either at peace and thus you are, or you're not at peace and thus you are not. It's almost like it's automatic. It's an automatic gifting of of recognition. Mm-hmm. The thing is, is that I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out what the fuck does at peace mean, right? So, mm-hmm. for example, so for example, if you scroll down on this page, the nation of the um, the Amnesty Coalition, this is a document that I have that I give away for free for people that they can get their their diplomatic their diplomatic passports, special mm-hmm. diplomatic passports, right? Right. So, if you scroll down this document, right. It's very, very short and very simple. I made it that way on purpose. Okay. So uh, I am excited to say that I will be at peace and foster peace between the nation of the Amnesty Coalition and the United States at all times, as per HN USC 11. I wish to retain my foreign government status at all time, and I find this to be of the utmost importance. 
Our definition and explanation of what is meant by be at peace will be described in section two of the statement. Mm -hmm. Now, section two is a, is basically a covenant. So it's the, it's a covenant of an ambassador who's oh. working on, who's, who's basically an ambassador at large on behalf of the amnesty coalition. Okay. Mm -hmm. And throughout this document, I'm talking about education. I'm talking about the the power of intent, the importance of intent. I'm talking about peace. I'm talking about a lot of different things, hostilities. I'm talking about people who have designed the system, Sun Tzu quotes. There's a lot of information here that basically what I'm doing is I'm breaking down and delineating what the definition of be at peace actually means. Right, because it's not clear in law, right? It's not clear. In, well... There, there are there are a lot of definitions in the dictionary. There are a lot of different definitions. It's more of like defining what what my version as my nation's version of be at peace means in relation to other nations in respect to what this guy is saying in this in this court case right here, you know, uh, you know, respecting uh, other nations and their members and and um you know, that kind of thing. So it's right. kind of like I'm trying to tie it all together in mm -hmm. a way where the, I don't leave any loose ends anywhere. Right. Now, I, I saw somewhere when I was when I was looking it up before, how does all of this conflate with the terms United States citizen and United States of America citizen? So, so United States is the corporation. Mm-hmm. The 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 actual landmass, the actual country known as the 50 states of America doesn't actually have an official name in, in their laws because they're trying to basically pretend as though there is no other name. Mm -hmm. They're trying to pretend as though they're the only option. So you can you can you can say it however you want to say it. Okay. As long as you don't just say United States. The only actually I take that back. The the only area I've ever seen that uh does describe this actually i take that back i take that back is 28 usc 1746 now when you sign a document under penalty of perjury and you can actually see on my document at the very end i have the person pursuant to 28 usc uh, 1746 uh, i have this line here right this comes from 28 usc 1746 if you're executing the document within the united states its territories or possessions or commonwealths and then it says here, if executed without the United States, I declare or certify, verify, or state under penalty of perjury under the laws of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. It's said as if it's two entirely different countries because it is two entirely different countries. So, so actually, I take that back. The only area I know of is this one, and they specifically call it the United States of America. So that that would probably be the best term to use. Is if that on part? Do you think that's termed that way on purpose? Yes, it's okay. termed on that way to confuse people. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. So now, no. have you? Uh, I'm sure you have come across a lot of resistance to what you're explaining. Absolutely yes. nothing. Absolutely no resistance. No resistance. Okay. Zero. Interesting. Even from and and I don't. I mean, I don't want to be mean, but even from let's. Even from people who are taking this information and applying it in a very stupid, poor manner, mm -hmm. even 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 there, we're still not seeing pushback on this. Well, wow, that's interesting. Uh, we are getting absolutely zero pushback. We are getting uh, we are getting pretty much one hundred percent cooperation from the government, uh, including the IRS. Uh, we we are seeing tax bills disappear. Uh, uh, everything everything just vanishes uh, very very rapidly without any mm. uh, fanfare at all whatsoever. So you said at the beginning of this podcast that uh, you don't pay state tax, city tax, and I'll explain that to you. I would like to just cover that real quick. That comes yeah. from um, uh, twenty six CFR one dot eight seven one dash one. CFR stands for Code of Federal Regulations. Okay. So obviously, if if you are a national and you've expatriated your U.S. citizenship, that means that you don't live in the United States. And United States means the District of Columbia. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they have two different terms that they use for people, right? They have they have resident alien 
and non-resident alien. It's very, very simple. Okay. Resident alien lives in the District of Columbia and is a U.S. citizen. A non-resident alien does not live in the District of Columbia and is not a U.S. citizen and is generally referred to as a non-citizen national. Okay. And I will just real quick, just to show you the I-9 form. Everyone's seen one of these. They've just never taken a, taken a five minutes to actually read it, right? The I-9 form, whenever you uh, get a job, they, they, you always fill this out, the Employment Eligibility Verification Form. Now, now check it out. I attest under penalty of perjury that I am. Go ahead and read box one and then read box two. A citizen of the United States, a non-citizen, a non-citizen national of the United States. See instructions. So, <laughs> so box number one is uh -huh. a person who lives in the District of Columbia. Box number two is a person who does not live in the District of Columbia and is a national as per 8 U.S.C. 1101 subsection A21. They've achieved that status through naturalization. 8 U.S.C. 1101 subsection A23. And through the naturalization process, they have expatriated naturally and they've retained. So you're getting rid of your citizenship, but you're retaining your nationality. I see. I, the average person would click one, I think, if they were. Everyone clicks one and right. no one's ever had anyone ever submit a document with number two on it to the point where we have businesses, almost every single business that we submit this document to. They go totally ballistic ape shit. They start hiring lawyers. It's hilarious, right? <laughs> so, so the thing is, is that in 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 twenty six CFR one point eight seven one dash one, it's very very simple. Okay, so for purposes of the income tax, alien individuals are divided generally into two classes, namely resident aliens and non resident aliens. Resident alien individuals are in general taxable the same as citizens of the United States. So taxable the same as people who live in the District of Columbia. That is, a resident alien is taxable on income derived from all sources, right? Including sources outside of, which without means outside of, the District of Columbia, right? So this is what everybody thinks they are. This is what everybody is operating off of, right? If I, if if they think that they have a tax liability on everything, okay? Uh -huh. And that's not true, right? Non-resident alien individuals, so nationals, are taxable only on certain income from sources within the United States, meaning within the District of Columbia, and on the income described in section blah, blah, blah from sources without the United States. So, when you, so this here, it says, and from sources, if you go and read these sections of this part, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't really go anywhere. So we uh -huh. just ignore this part. So we keep it really simple. If you live in the District of Columbia, you're a U.S. citizen. U.S. citizens pay taxes on everything, period. If you do not live in the District of Columbia, you are a national. If you are a national, you are a non-resident alien individual. If you are a non-resident alien individual, you're only paying taxes on the money that you make from the District of Columbia. So if you live in Idaho. And you... So if you live in Idaho and you change your nationality from a U.S. citizen to a national, you would actually fill out what's called a 1040 NR form. 1040 NR is the 1040 that everybody knows, but it's for non-resident aliens. Okay. And you would only fill this out. It says here, how much money, how much of this, how much of this, how much of this did you make in the United States? So let's say, for example, you're a defense contractor and you made a fuck ton of money from the United States through defense contracting. You would have to fill out a 1040 NR form and you would pay taxes on that money that you made from the District of Columbia. So um, a major defense contractor would fill out a non-resident alien form? Uh, if, they're, if they themselves are filed as a national, yes. Hmm. A national uh, does not live in the United States. And what would you surmise uh, the proportion of uh, just using defense contractors as, a, as an example uh, have filed that way? I I doubt any defense contractor knows any know anything about any of this information at all. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So yeah, I, they probably just operate just like normal, like everybody else does, right? Now here here's the part that's really pretty wild, right? And we're gonna read the second part, right? So this part's this part's pretty simple. This part's the part that they get you. This is how they get you. Okay. So um 
uh, non-resident alien. Uh, let's see here. Here it is. However, non-resident alien individuals may elect to be treated as U.S. residents for per- residents for purposes of determining their income tax liability. So what that means is, you know, a lot of people have heard this information of, uh, you know, um, uh, where in Title 26 does it say that taxes are voluntary, right? And it'll come up and it'll say uh, 26 CFR 601.602. The tax system is based on voluntary compliance and the taxpayer is complete and return the forms of payment of any tax owed, right? It's very well known that that the uh, the tax code says it's under voluntary, vo- it's all voluntary, right? Mm-hmm. But here, here's a missing definition, right? Because again, we're always looking at definitions. 26 USC 7701, subsection 14. Go ahead and read this. Uh, the term taxpayer means any person subject to any internal revenue tax. So okay. you as a national as a non-resident alien, you wouldn't say I'm not paying my taxes. Fuck the government. I'm not paying my taxes. You would say I am legally and lawfully not within the definitionary boundaries of the term taxpayer. Hmm. This is how, this is why we're not getting in trouble with the government. This is why we're not getting any blowback. We aren't operating from an emotional point of view. We're operating from a factual definitionary point of view. Yeah. Talk to me about uh, an instance. Well, like, for example, if you didn't pay your taxes, eventually the IRS would try and contact you, right? Nope. Nope. Not at all. Mm -hmm. Uh, Very, very easy to handle. So so basically it says here, however, non-resident alien individuals may elect under these particular sections to be treated as a U.S. citizen in 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 purposes of determining their income tax liability. We've already covered. It's a voluntary system. Right. So how does it actually work? The way it works is you you didn't realize what you were doing, and the whole thing is a fucking scam. But basically, what you did is you volunteered to pay taxes through the your and the first time you filed a W nine form when you were probably eighteen or sixteen years old and you got your first job. The gov- the IRS and the government viewed that as the election from 26 CFR 1.871-1. Mm-hmm. So you said, hey, hi, guys. I'd like to elect to be treated uh, as though I'm a US-, U.S. resident for purposes of determining my income tax liability, please. They said, okay, sure. You want to give us our, your money for no reason? Sure, fuck it. Uh, we're done with that. <laughs> so what happens is, is that you can do something called a revocation of election. Which means that what you're doing is, is you're you're revoking that initial election, and you do it through an affidavit form. I teach you on video number f- nine of my free course how to do a revocation of election. It's very very easy. You're going to use a form called a form fifty six. I'm not going to go through it all right now because it's not very simple. Uh, but basically what you're doing is you're going to go through a form 56 you're, and then you're going to fill this out. I teach you how to fill it out, fill this out. And then down here, it's going to say revocation or termination of notice. And you're going to do uh, other. And then you're going to type in a uh, uh, revocation of my election to be treated as a resident alien as per 26 CFR 1.871-1. And that's it. You're going to send this in. There's some other things you need to fill out on this. Uh, but you're revoking that initial election to be treated as a U.S. resident alien. And then there's a special way you're going to sign it. I teach you how to do all that in, in the uh, in the course. And then once you mail this document into the uh, Internal Revenue Service registered mail, the second they sign for it, your revocation is now active and you're no longer contracted with the Internal Revenue Service. Wow. So you said, definitely send it certified mail. I do registered on mine, yeah, but yeah, you can do yeah. certified. Yeah. With, yeah. You want signatures. You want, you want it all. You want all the services they're going to offer you at the, at the, at the post office. I would think, uh, cause I, I want to get into before we wrap it up. I want to get into your actual class, uh, where people can go to check it out. But I would think a lot of people that are in jail, do you know how many people are in jail right now for tax evasion? 
uh, uh, shockingly low numbers of people. Really? Shockingly low. Mm. Shockingly low. The IRS is is not this big boogeyman that everyone thinks they are. Mm-hmm. They they actually very, very rarely do they litigate. Mm. They only litigate when they know for sure there's a lot of money to be grabbed and it's going to be real fucking easy. Yeah, because like there are some celebrities that have gotten hit by that. Yeah, and that's the only court cases anybody can ever tell me. <laughs> Yeah. They well, always say like, Wesley Snipes, and I'm like, who else? Uh, I don't know. I only have one. Yeah, yeah and that happened like 15 years ago. So uh, okay, in the last 15 years, one one notable case. Great. It, okay. It's funny you say that because that's the, that it, that is the fellow I was thinking of. Yeah. Yeah, but the thing is, is that you you got one guy you can name from the past 20 fucking years. That mm-hmm. ain't a very good. That's not yeah. a very good track record. Yeah. And that and ain't very you, scary. One guy in 20 years. Okay, fuck it. You know, <laughs> you think do you think the reason behind it is it's just not a big enough money grab for them to No, he fucked up yeah. when you when you study the Wesley Snipes case, he fucked mm-hmm. up real bad. Oh, yeah. There's a guy named uh, there's a guy named Dave Champion. Actually, Dave, uh, isn't isn't uh, uh, what's his name? Hunter Biden and up for something like that right now. <laughs> I don't know. There's a guy named Dave Dave Champion. Uh, this guy is super awesome. He has a book called uh, Income Tax Shattering the Myths. Super cool dude. Uh, let's see here. The his he has his own podcast, Doctor Reality, uh, with Dave Champion. So what happened was the the in the Wesley Snipes trial, uh, they actually went to Dave Champion, and Dave Champion was like, uh, obviously Wesley Snipes had a really great, really expensive team, right? They went to Dave Champion and Dave Champion told them, he's like, what you guys are trying to do is the stupidest fucking thing I've ever seen. If you do it, you're going to go down in flames. It's the most horrible thing I've ever seen in my life. Uh, the team told Dave Champion to go fuck himself. Uh, they did what they wanted to do and Wesley Snipes got fucked. So wow. Dave Champion uh, almost saved Wesley Snipes. And uh, uh, the, because Wesley Snipes was not very well he wasn't really like very involved. He was like, I got the best people in the world. I'm spending a fortune. I know for a fact it's going to be okay. He didn't really have like a hands-on approach. He had more of a hands-off approach. Mm-hmm. So so once they came to Dave Champion and he said what he said and they said, fuck you, you're wrong, Dave. And they went and did what they wanted to do. Wesley Snipes went down. But I believe Wesley Snipes only went to jail for like three years. Yeah, I don't remember off the top of my head, but I, he, he is the guy that... Uh... So look, yeah. he was released after 28 months. So you also got to think to yourself, not only can you only name me one person in the past 20 years, the guy only went to prison for 28 months. Mm. Mm. And to be honest with you, to be honest with you, it was probably uh, just a uh, just a display. It was probably just a look at us, the big bad wolf IRS. You better not fuck with us. Because that, look, that's what happened. Here we yeah. are 20 years later. What do we still talk about? We still talk about one guy. Yeah, yeah. Maybe they, I don't know, maybe they needed him, uh, 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 you know, someone with a uh, a lot of name recognition to go down to scare the hell out of everybody else. <laughs> yeah, another guy that they talk about a lot is the big, huge mafioso guys. You know, yeah. they, they took them down through tap. But that's that's a whole nother. Again, it's like the definition of the word nation. Like, you don't really have the protections of law. You don't really have the protections of anything if your entire organization is designed to swindle people, you don't, right. you don't get the protections of law. So like, I don't feel like the, you know, the mafia getting hit with tax evasion is, I don't feel like that's fair because it's, it's, that's that they should be getting hit with tax evasion. I, I don't, you know, I don't care. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it's one of those things where, plus you have to keep in mind if you're filed as a U.S. citizen, you know, you, 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 you filed and elected to be treated as though you live in the district of Columbia and as per 26 USC, uh, uh, 26 CFR uh, 1.871-1, you, uh, you're taxable on all income derived from all sources. Mm-hmm. Now, you, you had mentioned uh, a, a way to say you live in California, which it would be different from, you can't say the state of California, right? I always say, I always say the unincorporated California state or the unincorporated de jure California state, which means of original law. Mm-hmm. I, I'm very, very explicit about it because it's like, I don't want to, I don't want to mince words and get, get, you know, get myself into something hairy. 
when you do it that way and you're very, very clear about the definitions of the words, uh, the IRS, I actually filed to put a pin on my social security number and the IRS won't even fucking talk to me. They literally won't even respond to my communication. They won't. I call them. They won't call me back. Like they, they don't even want to talk to me, about which is a what? shame because I don't about anything about what uh, uh, I was. I was trying to put a pin on my on my social security account, um, a pin number, like a special like oh, ide- okay. identity theft pin number thing. Right. So the thing is, is that when you start to really get this stuff and you start to really talk about it and they and, and everyone can tell that, you know what you're talking about, they just they don't even want to talk to you. man. They just. Even if you want to talk to them, they they don't want to talk to you uh, just, because just, I think I think the reason why is because they don't want people hearing about this information. Uh-huh. They don't want people asking questions. Mm. You send in a form 56. And then now all of a sudden everyone's asking questions. What the fuck is this? Why is it filled out this way? What is the election to be treated as a resident alien esper? And they go, oh, fuck, you know, give me that. You know, the, the, the very few people who do know about this information, they, they want to keep this quiet. They don't want anybody calling these people. They don't want these people talking to their people on the phone. They don't they, they're scared. It, it The whole thing flips. The government becomes absolutely terrified of you when you want this information. And that's why. I like 18 USC 11, and that's why I'm at peace, because I I know that they find me terribly dangerous, and I know they're terrified of me. But mm-hmm. the thing is, is, I'm not I'm not trying to attack them or crush them in any way. Mm-hmm. I'm still at peace. They're terrified of me, but I'm at peace. Mm-hmm. I understand what you're saying. Uh, I, I wanted to ask two questions before we uh, sure, sure. Before, before we run out of time. One was about the draft, or right now it's called the Selective Service that you sign up for. Oh. How do the, these uh, laws affect that? The other thing I wanted to ask you about was, um, well, if you could touch on that. The I Selective did- Service only applies to U.S. citizens and residents uh, who live inside of the United States. So if you're if you're filed as a US citizen or a resident alien, which 99% of everyone in America is, uh you would be uh uh someone who could get called upon in times of war mm-hmm. for selective service, conscription, etc., for service. If you are a national and you've gone through the process of naturalization by conferring nationality of a state upon yourself after birth by any means whatsoever, and you've also expatriated as a part of that naturalization process, you would no longer be part of jury duty. You would no longer be part of taxation. You would no longer be a part of selective service, conscription, et cetera. Mm. Interesting. And the other question I was going to ask you is, are you still eligible to receive Social Security when you attain yes. it? And Social Security is attached to the public political corporation. It's not actually attached to you at all. So mm-hmm. as long as you learn to to use and handle and operate that public corporation for yourself, uh, uh, you never, ever lose. In fact, you can actually do all sorts of crazy tricks. You can actually... I haven't tested this yet necessarily, but but I'm pretty damn sure at this point you could actually start collecting Social Security literally whenever you want. You could be like 35 years old and start collecting the Social Security. Mm. Um, when you set everything up right and you know the definitions of the words and you move some things around. I haven't done all that because it's just it's probably a lot of work. Uh, and I just don't really want to get into all that. I'm I'm in a whole different kind of area when it comes to financials and stuff. It's really exciting. It's a lot more money than I'd ever get from Social Security. So uh, I'm focusing on those areas, but um, there's probably a lot of really crazy tricks and, and, and things that you could do with your social security account by learning this information um, that wouldn't be accessible to you as a U.S. citizen. I see. Well, as a U.S. citizen, they do have a uh, they do know how much you put into the system during your working life. Yeah, but the thing is, is that. Uh, if you never put one penny into your social security your entire life, you would still get the full benefits of social security from retirement age all the way to your death. Well, it varies based on how much you put into it during your work life. No, no, it has nothing to do with that at all. whatsoever. actually every time you pay into your social security, it actually fucks up your trust the way that it's set up. Hmm. 
the way that social security is actually set up is you're never supposed to pay a dime into it ever your whole life. And it's supposed to, uh, do a lot more for you than just help you when you're 65. It's, it's supposed to actually pay all your bills. Uh, it's actually, uh, the social security act is actually from 1935. Well, it was during the Roosevelt administration. Yeah. Yeah. But the thing you have to realize is yeah. 1935, the thing you have to be careful, the thing, the thing that people need to be careful about social security is what other major monstrous humongous act was passed around that exact same time period. Do you know the answer? The only one that comes to mind is the securities exchange act. Uh, Actually, yes, that it that was, that was part of the deal. You know, right? Do you know the yeah. larger one that was even above that? That was even that the, was part of that, but it was even the bigger part of that. Not off the, the top of my head. Emergency Banking Act. Oh, okay. So the Emergency Banking Act is when they took away all the gold, and they started mm -hmm. issuing Federal Reserve notes as completely bullionless totally credit-based system. Mm -hmm. And then they developed the Social Security Act as a way of moving the credit spinal cord of the dollar from gold and silver coins to human labor. Mm -hmm. The Social Security Act was literally like, they're like, okay, we're going to take away all the gold and silver so the money's not going to be backed by gold and silver. And everybody's like, what's it going to be backed by? And they're like, don't worry, it's going to be backed by the labor and power of the American people. And that was the social security act. Hmm. So the thing is, is that you, your social security is also is guaranteed to you despite any amount of money you put into it because it was part of it, the bill during the emergency banking act that you were going to have all of the money associated with your social security account. It was all included in that whole act. So the thing right. is, is that social security is yours you never, ever, ever need to pay one penny in your social security and it's going to be yours and you'll get all the benefits and all the money forever as soon as you file for it. And like I said, you'd be, you'd be shocked how you can file for it. And, and I've had some personal friends who have gone in and fought to get benefits and been denied. And they, they studied some of this stuff and they went in and they, they got a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> So the thing is, is that Social Security is all tied into the Emergency Banking Act. It's tied into the fact that the government is basically say, say, saying that because you float the entire American currency in exchange, we're going to take care of you. Mm -hmm. And that's what Social Security actually is. It has nothing to do with you. You were never supposed to pay into Social Security. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So where can people go, uh, Brandon, to... Uh sign up for your class or read more about your class yeah so so it's funny people are gonna laugh and i love it it's all a big joke i, I like to have fun my mm -hmm. website is one stupid mm -hmm. okay and i have basically what it is is i have a, a state national theory page so if you go to one stupid this was the original page that i launched and this is literally just a, a book's worth of material so up top you can download uh black's law versions one through six so you can use whichever one you want. I like the fourth myself the most, but I use I use other ones a lot too. And then this is just a basically a book. It's as you can see, it's it's quite long, right? Mm -hmm. And and you can see the scroll bar on the right. And it's just like if I were to just hold the down button, you can see it's it's about the size of a book. Mm -hmm. And I go in here and I and I make adjustments and I do things to this sometimes. Um, and I like that. It's like a live book. It's mm -hmm. like an, a live book. Okay. Constantly, constantly being edited. Yeah. Mm, con you know, somewhat constantly. Last time I edited it was six to 23. You can see up top here, right? Okay. Now in, uh, uh, the contract killer course is basically a video version breakdown of all of the points from that last page. Right. Okay. Now you go on here, you just sign up. It's just free. First name, last name, email, sign up. It's free. Okay. Okay. So, so, but if you want the, the book version, if you prefer to read, you're going to get kind of like the hottest, newest information. Cause I edit it on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. If you want more of like a show and tell version where I cover how to fill out a lot of the forms and stuff, that's not in the state national theory page, you'll do the course really a combination of doing them both is, is the best way to do it. In my opinion. I see. Okay. And, and I have a lot of other things and, and I'm on tons and tons of, of podcasts like this one. And we talk mm -hmm. about, 
all sorts of things and financials. And, and there's a lot of different areas that this research goes into. So you guys can check out other podcasts or, or whatever you want. And uh, other things that I have on here, I have. Uh, and, and the amnesty coalition has a site itself. Yeah. The amnesty coalition, well. it's, it's just a page on my website. I, see. I, I okay. will, I will admit it's a bit more advanced. I wouldn't recommend that you start here necessarily. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also uh, my Cucumbers Law Dictionary and Affidavit Novation. This is also a little bit advanced. This is actually <laughs> uh, this is actually a a, a, a full blown contractual adjustment that you can download. It's a full document, and you send it into every area of the government, and it actually redefines a lot of the words that we've covered in this podcast, as well as a lot of other definitions. Mm-hmm. So what you're doing is you're actually reprogramming the entire matrix. And there's a whole document with all the addresses and everything that I have all ready to go for you if you want to send that in. But again, the, these things are a bit advanced. I think most people should just start with the course and the state mm-hmm. national theory and just read and, and clear up some of the definitions of some of the words first before getting into all that. I see. Well, we'll put a link to that um, on on both the those of the those of you that are listening to us there'll be a link right in the show notes and obviously if you're watching us on youtube you can see it right here but there'll also be a link to that site and uh, i recommend you check them out read, read more about what brandon has to say it's very interesting and i certainly appreciate you coming thank on you tonight much. brandon thank you very much tom i appreciate your time you, and I you make me you uh you make me uh curious and nervous at the same time <laughs> <laughs> i always tell everybody uh f- fear and terror is is a is a natural in my opinion unavoidable even though some people tell me they're not i don't believe them because i was absolutely out of my skull fucking terrified of all of mm-hmm. this for about six months and i did it anyways uh i believe it's just part of the process but but you know, a, uh, a while ago, when when I first wrote my my state national theory page, I put on there like, yo, you, you guys need to be careful because this is like, you know, uh, this is kind of kind of scary. But I actually rewrote it just recently in June. And I literally say right here, I have honestly not seen hardly anyone get in trouble with this, this information. Mm-hmm. There's a part of me that wants to warn you that the application of this technology. But frankly, there is no there is absolutely no real factual basis for that. Uh you know, and I get into some information, tens of thousands of people are doing this. And, and as long as you're at peace and as long as you never sign affidavits or anything under penalty of perjury, unless you fully understand them, frankly, I, I really don't think anyone's going to get in trouble with absolutely any of this information. Interesting. Very cool. Well, I certainly appreciate you coming on tonight, Brandon, and uh, I'll be following you. I'll be uh, checking out your, your website as well. And I urge my viewers and listeners to do the same. So thank Thank you so much. much, Okay. Have a great night, sir. Thank Thank you. you.